No other God can be called a friend. No other God can be called a redeemer. No other God's coming back again. And how we love. And how we love your name. Jesus, you're the beautiful one. We Hello, good evening, Gate City. Just want to welcome you guys to our Wednesday services. We're so glad that you're here. Let's just stand as we go into a time of worship. If you're new here, we're so glad you're here. We'll have more direction for you after worship. So let's just lift our hands. 
Let's just focus on the Lord. Let's behold him together. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and worship you and learn from your word. Father, we focus our gaze on you. We let go of everything that has happened today. And we just say you're the most important thing. You're most beautiful. Help us, Lord, to focus on you and let go. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I choose this day to be grateful, Lord. I'll give you praise with an open heart. I'm waking up.
to the sanctuary tonight with thanksgiving and offering a praise and gratitude you did not have to choose us but you did oh your word says we love you because you first loved us oh we love you because you first Choose us, but you did. Thank you. Thank you. You did not have to choose us, but you did. Oh, yes, you did. And I'm saying thank you. Thank you. You did not have to save us from our sin, but you did. Oh, and it's my.
that word. Amen. You're agreeing with that word that it is finished. And after singing in that song in Christ alone, I just feel in my spirit, I agree with that word that it is finished. And it's so easy moment after moment, service after service to come in and sing songs speak and sing but not have that moment of just connecting with what Jesus has done and let's just take a moment here and agree with what he's done it's not a myth it's not just a story it's not a fairy tale it's truth it's life
So the last verse of that song, when we've been there 10,000 years, when we've been there 10,000 years, as we get ready to sing that, just let's put our hope there and not here. Right? Let's put our hope there and not here. We are citizens of another government. We are citizens of another country. This, this is not really our home. Now, it will be our home in the millennium when Jesus transforms it all back and makes it ready for the arrival of the Father in the new Jerusalem. But right now, this reality is not our home. Our, our hope is not so much in a place as it is in a person. Our hope is in the person of Jesus and who he is and that he is good and that we get to be with him forever and ever and ever. Man, when we sing that, just think about that. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we know less days to sing God's praise. That's, that's what we're going to get to do forever and ever and ever and ever in the full presence of God. So, Lord, as we just get ready to sing that, you're right. You're right, Joy. It's, it's more than a fantasy. It's more than some utopic visage. It's, this is real. It's our, it's, it's, it's our future. It's more real than what we feel around us right now. As heaven and earth will pass away one day. And the reality of that which is real will come crashing in on that which is temporal. And all this will fade in the surpassing glory and greatness of God. And we will sing and we will worship and we will be with you, Jesus, forever and ever and ever. And our hearts long for that. Our hearts long for you to fix that which is broken. Our heart longs for you to restore that which is distant. Our heart longs for you to reconcile that which is fragmented. Lord, we know, Jesus, this is your plan. This is your purpose. And you are going to fix everything. And in the meantime, Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit as a down payment, guaranteeing that which is to come. That enables our hearts to worship you and to draw close and that you draw close to us, even in this reality we're in right now, Lord. So we worship you. We sing that in faith. We sing that in confidence. We sing it in courage. And we sing it, Lord, out of a place of hope and faith, the evidence things not seen, the very substance of that which we hope for, we can even experience right now in Jesus. We've been there 10,000 years. And let's sing that. Let's open our mouth. Let's sing that.
let's do that. Let's just all lift our hands if you can. Just so we praise you. We praise you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We enter your gates with thanksgiving, Lord. Grateful. We enter your courts with praise. You are worthy. We praise you. We bless you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. We bless your holy name, God, for you are worthy. You are good. You are worthy of all that we are, Lord. We offer our bodies, even on this Wednesday night in June, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Lord, our spiritual act of worship is offering our entire body, Lord, everything, all of our members, body, soul, and spirit as a living sacrifice. Lord, though it burns the flesh, Lord, we we stay in that place, Lord, and we know, Lord, you are transforming us. You are changing us by the renewing of our mind, God through your powerful presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit that we depend upon and we welcome and we know that you are meeting us tonight, each and every one of us, man, woman, and child, young and old, red and yellow and black and white, Lord, you are meeting every single one of us, Lord, exactly with, with what we need tonight, Lord. And we say yes, Lord, we open, the, open our hearts and we invite you in, Jesus, to come and make us, Lord, into a wholehearted, followers devoted to you, trusting you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, Lord. Trusting you, not leaning to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, Lord, we acknowledge you. We have courage and confidence that you are directing our paths, even when we don't understand, even when we look through a glass darkly, and we can trust your leadership, because you are good, and you are the potter, you are the master builder, you are the vine dresser, you know exactly what you're doing and we're so grateful for that Lord we love you thank you tonight Lord in the sweet and great name of Jesus amen amen hallelujah amen could you be seated just for a second before we all go to our individual class I just want to give you just a quick welcome on Wednesday night so glad that you're here for our Wednesday night service time of teaching and if you're here for the very first time haven't been here before we want to connect with you there's a little card in the seat in front of you. Take a moment, fill that out, put it in the little um, black box as you go out. It'll give us a chance to make a connection with you. And also, that's a way to give back there as well. It explains on that black box how to do that for you to give tithes and offerings and whatnot. So we're glad that you're here. I want to make a couple of quick announcements. Actually, only one specifically is that if you're a parent, I want to invite you to um, sign your kids up for Elijah Camp coming up on the 28th of this month. The information is right there, and there is space limitations there. So if you have a, a young child and you want to get them involved in camp, the information is there. We encourage you to do that right away. You can get that information right on your phone, and it'll send a link back to that. So make a specific note of that. All right. We're doing on Wednesday night, we've started our new um, a series of classes, and I will tell you exactly where to go before you are dismissed tonight so we're all super clear. In this room, you can stay if you want to be part of the study in the book of the Song of Solomon. That's going to be right in here. If uh, you want to do the um, auspicious class of the devil, demons, and deliverance with none other than Dustin, it's going to be in room number 14 out to your right down the hallway on the right. And if you are in the abiding with the maker class, that is downstairs in the greenhouse. You turn right, go all the way to the end, turn right, go down the stairs, go in and go all the way in, into the hallway. That's where the classes will be. If you are a middle school student and you're here tonight, you're welcome to go out and upstairs to the middle school room. Does everybody know where they're going? Everybody clear? Anybody not clear, raise your hand. All right, good. Now we can all stand, and we'll take about a few-minute transition to our uh, particular locations, and we'll resume in about three or four minutes right in this room.
If you're staying in here for Song of Solomon class, we have notes on the back tables um, if you want notes. And we also have a QR code. If you want a digital copy of the notes, you can go to the back door and scan the QR code and get a digital copy. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started just to maximize on our time. As Billy mentioned last week, he is traveling uh, in the Middle East this week, visiting our mission base and our team over there. So if you think of him this week, pray for him. And uh, I'm going to be filling in for him tonight. My name is Jamie burns I've been a part of um, the staff here since 2004. So I've been on staff here a minute, and I'm very excited to teach Song of Solomon tonight. We had some issues with the notes. Billy and I collaborated on this, and between his formatting and my formatting, they're kind of messed up. So please forgive us for any formatting errors that you see, and I just am probably not going to read the notes to you guys tonight. I'll trust that you guys can read the notes and study them on your own. Um, I'm just going to teach this from my heart. It's an overview tonight of the Song of Solomon. Billy kind of teed up the ball last week, giving an introduction and kind of sharing what his journey um, has been into the Song of Solomon and what this book has meant to him. So tonight, I'm just going to give you a, a big picture, broad overview. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, with open hands and open hearts, hungry for revelation. Lord, I pray that you would encounter us tonight, that you would awaken us to the truths of your emotions, of your love, of how you feel about us. Lord, that you would awaken us to the romance, the divine romance of the gospel, the love relationship that you desire with each one of us. God, I pray tonight that you would open up our eyes with a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we would see you rightly, that all the false ideas that we believe about you would, would fall by the wayside, and tonight truth would come and illuminate our minds, illuminate our spirits, illuminate our souls. Lord, I pray that you would unlock this Song of Solomon to each one in here. God, that you would take each one of us on a unique journey into the, the, the depths of this book. Come, Holy Spirit, do what you love to do. Take my weak words and match them with your power from on high. Lord, awaken each heart. I thank you that the anointing is in them, and they don't need a teacher, but Holy Spirit, you will be the teacher tonight. So we look to you and we welcome you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I promise I'm going to get to the Song of Solomon, but I want to start in Matthew. Because as Billy mentioned last week, the Song of Solomon, it's, we, we approach it, in this class, we're going to approach it mostly as an allegory. If you read it, it's poetic. It's, there's flowery language. Um, it can mean different things to different people. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about it as an allegory. But I want to give you a little broader context. Because to be honest, I wouldn't be up here, Billy wouldn't be up here teaching Song of Solomon as an allegory. And when I say allegory, that's just a fictional story without a basis in history that's symbolic. So think Chronicles of Narnia, right? That's an allegory. We, we see Aslan. He represents Jesus or good, overcoming evil, this fierce battle. So that's what I mean if you've forgotten allegory from seventh grade English class. So I, we wouldn't be teaching Song of Solomon in this kind of allegorical way if it wasn't backed up throughout the entirety of Scripture with, with literal passages. Does that make sense? We always want to approach the Bible with, a, well, what does it say at face value? We want to have a literal approach, okay? And, and we only can, can understand allegories and, and spiritualized texts when we have concrete 
literal evidence from other passages of Scripture. Does that make sense? Okay, so I, that's why I want to start tonight just in Matthew 22. Because Jesus, at the end of his ministry, he says what I like to think of as the thesis of, of the kingdom. The most important statement, one of the most important statements about the kingdom. And Jesus says this in Matthew 22 too. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a good king who's arranging a marriage for his son. Matthew 22 too. If you don't know this verse, you've got to memorize it. You've got to spend some time with it. The kingdom of heaven is like a good king, a good father who's arranging a marriage for his son. What does this mean? It means that we cannot understand the kingdom of God. We cannot understand Christianity if we don't understand that the eternal mission of the father is to arrange or prepare a marriage for his son. God the father is the ultimate wedding planner. I love looking at like pictures or videos of these elaborate million dollar weddings. You know, like just the, the, the most wealthy individuals in the world, the most wealthy fathers in the world throwing a wedding for their daughters and how elaborate and how well planned and it just leaves you stunned. And then I think that's going to look cheap and tacky compared to the wedding the father is throwing for his son, the marriage supper of the lamb. God is preparing a wedding and he's making ready a bride. Now every bride's beautiful on her wedding day and that's my confidence when I look at the church, when I look at us, is that God is not finished. He is he is zealously committed to having a perfect bride who's ready without shame, without blame, without spot, without blemish, and without wrinkle. The Holy Spirit is committed to making us a worthy partner for Jesus. And Jesus himself, in John 17, 24, we see it. He has this desire. He tells, he prays to his father and he says, Father, I desire it's like, Jesus, what do, you, what do you want? God, give him whatever he wants. And he says, Father, I desire those that you've given me to be with me where I am. I want my bride that you've promised me. So when Jesus says that you won't understand the kingdom in its fullness unless you understand it in this context of a wedding, that natural history, it began where? Not a trick question. In Eden. Natural history begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden, with a marriage, right? Adam and Eve. It begins with a wedding. Guess how natural history is going to culminate? In the New Jerusalem, an Eden like city, with a wedding called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 7 Behold, the bride has made herself ready. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. When you understand this is a story from Genesis to Revelation, that Christianity was always meant to be a love affair of the heart. It was always meant to be a love relationship with God and his people. Mount Sinai and Exodus, we think of that as, oh, God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. No, 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 that was a betrothal. That's when God betrothed himself to the nation of Israel to be a husband to them. That's where it starts, and we see it all the way through the book of Revelation. God is a bridegroom, jealously, zealously pursuing his people. Our lives make sense in the context of the romance. Because this is written on our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, eternity has been set in our hearts. God has set eternity in the hearts of men. What does this mean? This means that this story is written on our hearts, this romance. I tell you how I know, Hollywood has made untold billions off of this story. Over and over and over again, we'll pay the, the money, the $10, $20, whatever it is, to go to the movies to see the same storyline played out a hundred different ways. Because we love this story. This, every, every fairy tale, we know every fairy tale must have a hero, must have a king. And he must be handsome, and he must be kind, and he must be benevolent, and he must be strong, and he must have a beauty that he's in love with. And we're all okay if the girl is, we're, we're, actually we're okay if she's a queen, as long as she's beautiful and kind and cares about the poor. 
But there's something that happens in us when the king falls in love with the poor girl who has nothing to offer him but her love. Come on, who's seen Cinderella? Who's seen the, like, 1950s cartoon version? The live-action version, recently released? Who's seen um, Ever After? Made in Manhattan? A Cinderella story? Brandy starring as Cinderella? Over and over and over, we, we just keep paying the money to see the same story. Why? Why does even someone who's never heard of Jesus and the gospel, why does this story resonate? It's written on our hearts. That the king would fall in love, the prince would fall in love with Cinderella. Poor, wretched, covered in ashes. That he would see some inherent goodness in her and set his affections on her. We cheer at that, yes. Let him pick Cinderella, not anyone else. We rejoice over this story because it's our story. It's our story. It's the story of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is you have to repent of your sins and believe that Jesus is Lord, and if not, you're going to hell. That's the truth of the gospel. But the good news of the gospel is there's good news to the poor, right? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news to the poor. What's the good news to the poor? There's going to be a wedding. And not only are you invited, the king, he picked you. He chose you. You're marrying the king. Get ready. That's good news for the poor. We're all signing up for that, right? This is, this is our story. This is the gospel. John Eldridge, he writes a book called Sacred Romance. If, you, if you're interested in the bridal paradigm of the kingdom, and when I say paradigm, that's just a big word for lens. It's a way of viewing something. Put on your glasses and see it a certain way. He writes a book called Sacred Romance, and it just it's a, a book about the story of the the gospel, the story of the romance with God. And in it, he says, modern evangelicalism, it reads a lot like an IRS 1040 tax form. The data is all there, the information's all there, but it doesn't take your breath away. And he goes on to say, and I'm going to just loosely uh, paraphrase, but he goes on to say that somehow in the ebb and flows of life, the romance that we initially experience with God, it gets replaced with Christian service and activity. And we just kind of end up going through the motions of Christianity with our souls divorced from the romance that we were created for. Now, Song of Solomon, it's more than a good study because this book, it gives us just riches. It gives us so much insight into the story of the gospel. It gives us so much insight into the heart of God as a bridegroom. Before I started studying the Song of Solomon, I had no idea that God was a bridegroom. And as I've shared on this, I've had one of the most touching moments for me was when I had a saint who was probably in her 80s and I'm preaching on Song of Solomon and she comes up to me and says, I've been in church all my life and nobody's ever taught me this and she's weeping. I had no idea. And I'm not discouraged because Hosea prophesies in Hosea 2.16 about this. He says, in the last days, it's gonna come to pass. Last days meaning before Jesus returns, It's going to come to pass that you, God says, you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. So there's going to be a shift in the body of Christ all over the world, in the the nation of Israel, where it's going to be this, your master, your Lord, and I'm your slave, right? We use that. I'm just an unworthy servant at the end of the day. That's a, 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 a paradigm of the kingdom, right? He's master, I'm slave. There's a greater revelation coming than master-slave. 
right? Because Jesus says, I, I don't just call you servants, I call you friends, right? But there's something coming even greater than a friend. Because you can have many friends, but you only have one spouse. And before Jesus returns, remember Revelation 19.7 tells us the bride's going to be ready. Well, the Holy Spirit is going to raise up messengers all over the earth. In every tribe, tongue, people, and nation that are going to proclaim this truth. God is a husband. He's a bridegroom, and he's radically in love with you. There's going to be a wedding. Get ready. So when we start Song of Solomon, when we're looking at this, it's so important. It's not just, oh, this is a nice little study. I initially, when I heard it, it was like so over my head. I couldn't understand it. I had no, like I couldn't even get my mind around. God is a bridegroom. There's going to be a wedding. <laughs> what? So foreign. But it's so, it's so critical. You want to get free from shame. You want to get free from spiritual boredom. You want to get free from legalism. You want to get free from self-hatred. Get revelation of how he feels about you. Get confidence in the love of God and everything changes. You'll be able to make sense of natural history. You'll be able to make sense of your own history. You'll be able to make sense of where you're at on your spiritual journey right now when we get understanding that the whole of this life is about a good father who's arranging a marriage for his son. And you're the, the chosen one that he's going to get ready. He's going to make ready to be a worthy partner, a comparable partner for his son. Amen. Good introduction. All right. <clears throat> let's, look at, let's look at this Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon follows this basic storyline that I just mentioned that we all love. The king, he's fallen in love with the poor girl, the little girl who's tending the goats out in the field. <laughs> No chance of ever getting with the king, except for he picks her. He chooses her. He sets his affection on her. And we know in every fairy tale, there's got to be a villain, right? There's got to be somebody trying to kill the girl. The hero has got to have an epic battle, and he's going to win his bride. And in our story, we have someone, a villain, right? A thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And there has to be a, a point in every fairy tale, in every plot, there has to be a point where you start scratching your head and kind of getting antsy in your seat, wondering how this thing's going to turn out because it looks like darkness is prevailing. It looks like evil might win out over good. And then we know that that tension and that drama gets resolved because every fairy tale has a happy ever after, happily ever after. And this is, this is the book of Song of Solomon. We see this here in, in this book. So the story starts out with the, the shepherd girl, and she, she has encountered his love. And she's, she's been intoxicated by his love because she's, she's crying out, this desperate cry at the opening of the book, let him kiss me with the kisses of his word, for, for your love is better than wine. She has got this revelation that his love is better than anything this life can offer. Better than, than the greatest pleasures of this life. And she's at this point in her journey, and in chapter 1, and, and Billy talked a little bit about this last week, but she's, she's burnt out. She's been taking care of everybody else's vineyard. And her own heart, her own vineyard, she's neglected. She's totally burnt out. She's totally neglected a relationship with him, though she's encountered this love that's better than wine. She's at this, this desperate place. We've all been there, right? We've all been in those places where we've kind of burned out. We've done a, all this ministry. and had not even been taking care of our own heart. We've done all this work, and we've neglected the thing that's most important, our relationship with Jesus, and she cries out, and she, she's like, I want to encounter you. She like, realizes she's living behind a veil. And she's like, I want to see you. I'm desperate. I want to know you. I want to see you. Kiss me. Awaken my heart again. Anybody ever prayed a prayer like, God, I, I, I need you. I need to see you. I need to know you more. This is where she's at. And he comes to her in that place with such kindness, with such tenderness, and he romances her heart. He speaks truth over her, 
and affirmations over her over and over and over and over again. He tells her he loves her. He tells her she's beautiful. He tells her she's faithful until she starts to believe it for herself. And in his kindness and in the way he's lavishing her with love and affection, she gets an initial revelation of his beauty. She begins to love him in return. So it's 1 John 4, 19. We love the Lord because he did what? Loved us first, right? And so this is how Jesus leads. I, when I think of the book of Song of Solomon, I often think about, I think of it as a leadership manual to give us insight into how Jesus leads. In this book, in chapter 1, he, the, the, the chapter closes with him making this affirmation over her. He says, behold, you're fair, my love. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. What does that mean? Well, we know doves are monogamous creatures. They have one mate their entire lives. And we also know that doves have no peripheral vision. They only look directly at what's in front of them. So when he's telling her she has dove's eyes, he's saying, you're faithful, you're loyal, you're wholehearted, you're single-minded, you're focused on me. You're beautiful. This is a beautiful attribute that you have. Well, he knows that she's going to disobey him in one more chapter. (laughs) And yet he still speaks that she's faithful and that she's loyal. he, He is like no other. He's a leader like no other. And in chapter 2, he comes to her, just like Billy said, he comes to her in a way that she wasn't expecting. She was used to being romanced by him in the bridal chambers. She was used to eating the cakes of raisins and the apples and just hearing the sweet uh, affirmations from his heart to hers, him telling her how beautiful she is, how awesome she is. And he comes to her and he invites her to go with him on the mountains to wage war. And she's like, uh, no, (laughs) I don't like war, and I'm afraid of heights. I don't do mountains. I don't do leopards, none of that stuff. That's not me. I'll stay here in the bridal chamber. I like it here, like my roses, my candles, my pillows. This is nice. That's not for me. And she says no, and she tells him to go away. She wasn't necessarily being rebellious. She's immature, and she compromises out of her own fears, out of her own insecurities, out of her own lack And he turns and he walks away. But this is what's so stunning because if it was me, I probably would say something like, what do you mean? I've been spending all this time with you. I've been telling you how beautiful you are, how much I love you. Don't you trust me? You don't trust me. That's what it is. You don't trust me. Well, what has all this been for? We would probably, you know, use guilt, manipulation, you know, we would shame to kind of get her to to do what we want her to do. Jesus never manipulates in his leadership. He never forces us to do anything. Everything in the kingdom is we get to voluntarily choose, and it's a way that we display our love. Obedience is nothing more than putting our love on display. So he turns not out of rejection. He gives her what she's desirous. She wants to stay there. She doesn't want to go with him. So he leaves. And he's so confident in the power of the romance. He's so confident in his love. He knows she's not going to like it without him. And she goes back to the bridal chamber. And she realizes she's not in love with the bridal chamber. She's in love with him. She wants his presence. It's, It's better to be terrified on the mountains with him than to be alone in the familiar, comfortable place without him. And so what does she do? Chapter 3. She goes looking for him. She's in, in, in a season of discipline. And, you know, we think of discipline as the Lord smacking us around, the Lord giving you flat tires um, in the morning because you didn't do so. You know, like, we think of all these, like, terrible things, and that's how he must discipline us. And yet his discipline is causing an ache in her heart. <laughs> His discipline is stepping back just a little bit so she starts to miss him and come after him and choose obedience over disobedience, over compromise. And so she begins to look for him. And when she finds him, she says, I held him and I did not let him go. She had learned her lesson, like, I'm never going to do that again. 
Anybody ever been in those seasons with the Lord? You come through something, you think, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to say no in that way again. I've learned my lesson. And so in chapter in chapter. Uh, Three, she, she finds him, and then she gets a revelation of what it cost him to love her. She gets a revelation of the cross, of the price he paid to, to be with her. And in chapter 4, he continues to affirm her. Mike Bickle says it like this. He calls out the budding virtues in her heart. Now, this is something that Jesus does, and it's just it's stunning. That he sees those things that are not as though they were. That he sees the end from the beginning. But he treats us in the beginning like we're going to be in the end if we cooperate with the grace of God on our lives. Now that's stunning. That he can see me in my sin, in my brokenness, in the ash heap like a beggar, but treat me like a prince in that place. Because he knows he's going to raise me from that ash heap and he's going to seat me on a throne like a prince. That he knows there's coming a day when I'll be delivered and you'll be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And that you'll be transferred in to the son, the the kingdom of the son of God's love. And so God treats us in the beginning like we're going to be in the end. And that's what he does for her. He tells her she's faithful though she's about to disobey. Because he knows there's faithfulness in her. It might be small, but it's real. And in time, it's going to grow. Our love for God, sometimes it's really small. But God treats it as authentic, as real. He doesn't say your love is small. He says your love is real. I have a six-year-old son, and we named him after a great intercessor, and I've told him the story many times. And he told me the other day, he said, "I'm I'm a man of prayer. Just like Father Nash, who we named him after this great intercessor. He's six. I, I could have said, well, actually, you're not really like Father Nash. I mean, he prayed and opened the heavens, and he got revival in, in cities, and there was massive transformation, and he travailed for three days, fasting, no food, no water. That was a man of prayer. But I would never say that to my son, right? Because at six, he has this desire to be a man of prayer, and he does pray for a six-year-old. You know what I said to him? Yes, you're a man of prayer. You sure are a man of prayer, just like Father Nash. You're a great man of prayer. And he stuck his little chest out, and he held his little head high, and he smiled, and he kind of walked off. And you know what? In the grace of God, he'll become a great man of prayer. We just call forth. That's how the Lord trains us. That's how he leads us. And he can look at all of us Like I looked at my six-year-old son. He doesn't look at you and say, well, you could be better. There's people that know more of the Bible than you do, and they're younger than you. We we have all these voices in our head. Every time I teach a class, I ask this question, have you ever felt like you should be further along in your Christian journey than you are right now? Like you should be further down the road every time. Hands, most, like the majority of the room raises their hands. We hear these same lies from the enemy. And, And we think it's the voice of God. You should be more. You should be praying more. You should be fasting. Look at that other person. Look at you. And God doesn't treat us like that. He says, you're a great intercessor. You're a great faster. Lord, I I haven't really fasted much past breakfast. You're doing so good. You made it three hours today. Good job. He's so encouraging. He's so affirming. Do you know in this book, um, there's zero criticisms, even when she's in disobedience? He doesn't criticize her. He doesn't shame her. He doesn't speak harshly with her. And in these eight chapters, you know how many times he affirms her? 84 times in eight chapters. 84 times. David, King David, he understood this, guys. He said in Psalm 18, he said, God, your gentleness has made me great. Your gentleness. Jesus is the most affirming, gentle Tender, kind, leader, husband, father. I don't know anyone like him. We all aspire to be like him. Everyone falls short. He can look at David and say, there's a man after my heart. Am I reading this story right? The murderer, the adulterer, the liar. He acted like an insane person and got an entire priesthood killed. 
we talking about the same guy? He's a man after your heart. And God also said that he fulfilled all of my purposes in his generation. There's no one as kind as God. There's no, his editing process is just amazing. He sees the seed forms, the budding virtues, and he speaks them over us. He calls them, calls them forth until we become confident in love. And that's exactly what happens to the Shulamite. And at the end of chapter 4, there's a shift, and it shifts the entire book. The first four chapters of Song of Solomon, the bride, the Shulamite, she's very focused on her inheritance in Jesus, what she gets from him. She likes the way he makes her feel. It's the reason you and I, we all probably got saved the same, for the same reasons. I don't want to go to hell. I need some help with my life. I need to be delivered. I need, some, I need Jesus, right? Come make things better. Fix all the brokenness, right? That's when I got saved. That's what it was. Nobody told me, hey, you realize you're joining a kingdom. And Jesus, he's not just a savior. He's actually a Lord. He's a boss. And he's going to want your entire life, everything. And he's very jealous. He doesn't want to share you with anything or anyone. He actually wants to conform you 100% to look just like his son. So he will be crucifying your flesh. He's going to give you actually the Holy Spirit. He's going to put him inside of you. And he won't ever leave you alone. He won't ever relent until you look just like Jesus. And guess what? In the kingdom, if you're going to be a part of it, you're signing up for many trials and many tribulations. And if you want mature, perfect faith, guess what? The only way to get that is through many hardships. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kind, because testing of your faith produces perseverance, da, da, da. That's what you're signing up for. Do you still want to come forward? Right? No, we, we mostly don't hear that, though we probably should a little more, but we mostly don't hear that because we mostly, when you get saved, you're focused on, Jesus, make my life better. I don't want to go to hell. I want to get free. That's what her focus was initially. It was all about what she gets out of this. Make me feel good. Make me happy. And somewhere... When she realizes how much he loves her after he's affirmed her with love over and over and over again. And she gets a real revelation in chapter 3 of what it cost him to love her, to have her. Something shifts on the inside of her. And she begins to realize it's not about me. It's really about him. She used to say, my beloved is mine and I am his. My beloved is mine. And by, by the, the second half of the book, she begins to say, I am his. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. She kind of removes herself out of the equation altogether. She realizes he, he has an inheritance in me. He wants something from me. When we recognize that, everything shifts. He wants, he wants me to be a bride who's worthy of him. The Father is working everything in my life to make me a worthy partner for Jesus. And she gets that understanding of him. and She's so confident in his love. She prays this prayer at the end of chapter 4. And she says, awake, O north winds, which speak of the, the cold, bitter winds. And she says, come, O south winds, which speak of the warm, refreshing winds. Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat of his pleasant fruits. So she's praying and she's saying, I don't care what it takes. The testings, the trials, the hardships, bring them. The blessings, the refreshing, the renewal, bring it. Whatever mixture I need, Jesus, my life is not my own. I am bought with a price. I'm yours. And I just want you to be pleased with me. I want you to find a home here. I want to be a resting place for you. I want my life to bring you glory at the end of the day. That's it. I've heard people say, oh, don't pray for humility. Don't pray that because you, I'm like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea who Jesus is. I'm praying for humility. I'm praying that I would be just like him, conform to his image because that's our portion in this life. And I, I trust him. We can trust him. He's the perfect leader. He's the perfect leader. So she prays that prayer, and then here comes chapter 5. Saints of old have termed it the dark night of the soul. 
It's where she actually experiences the sufferings of the kingdom. She goes through this twofold test of suffering in chapter 5. The first test, he withdraws his presence. This time, not because of disobedience, but in response to her obedience. There are times when God steps back from you and you haven't done anything wrong and you're not in sin. Isaiah says, truly you're a God who hides yourself. There are times when God plays hide and seek with you. And he steps back just enough so that hunger begins to rise in your heart. And you get lovesick and you start saying, God, I miss so I need his presence, Jesus. I need more of you. And you start getting hungry, longing for him. And he invites you on a journey of hide and seek. Come find me. <laughs> Come find me. And so that was the first part. He lifted his presence a little bit, and she couldn't feel him. She couldn't hear him. She couldn't see him, and she'd done nothing wrong. And the second part is she suffers mistreatment. Mistreatment is a gift from the Lord to us. Oh, that we would never waste it. She suffers mistreatment at the hands of those who were in authority over her. Spirit, her spiritual authority. And they persecute her. And they mistreat her. And in the process, they rip her veil off of her. Now remember in chapter 1, she was complaining because she was a veiled woman. Oh, I, I don't want this veil, this separation between me and you. I'm desperate to meet with you. I'm desperate to encounter you. And as she goes through suffering and mistreatment, guess what happens? They rip the veil, but what happens? She can see him clearly. And in verse 10 of chapter 5, it's one of the greatest expressions of praise and adoration and worship, I think, in the whole Bible. She's bloodied, beaten, and bruised. Her veil's all ripped off. And all, all those around are kind of like, what happened to you? Don't you love God? If, if he were real, I don't think you would be going through all this. I mean, look what he's done to you. He's left you. He's abandoned you. Where, where is he? What, what's so great about him? Tell me, what, why are you still following him after what's going on in your life? And she goes into this just expression of worship and adoration. She says, my beloved, he's white and ruddy. He's chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy. They're black as raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. She goes on and on. And she says, this is my beloved. This is my friend. He's altogether lovely. And she started getting the side eye. How can you say this? What? Expression of praise. Have you ever seen somebody who's going through something tough and they're praising God through the midst of it? What is it? What, it, what kind of response does that produce in our hearts when we see that? We're like, wow, I want to know him like that. That's truly what got me into the house of prayer and the prayer movement. I was 20 years old. I had gone out. I knew Billy was starting the house of prayer in Atlanta. I went out for a week just to check it out. I had other plans of things I was going to do after I was done with college. And I went out to check out what they were doing. And to be honest, I, I wasn't too, I just, I didn't think it was for me, honestly. I, the prayer room wasn't really my thing. I, the worship wasn't really my thing. I I just thought, this isn't me. And uh, I was sitting in a, a teaching session. They, we kind of would spend some time in the prayer room, and then we would hear teachings from the different leaders out there at the House of Prayer in Kansas City. And a man came and taught our class, and his wife had died two weeks prior to the class that, that he taught. And so he came in, and you could tell he was, a, he was broken. He was, he was, you know, really tender. And he taught on the Song of Solomon. He did an overview of the Song of Solomon. And he talked, he talked, he got to chapter five, and he said, two weeks ago, I was at my wife's funeral. She, uh, 
she had a battle with cancer and she, she died. They were believing God to heal her and she died. And he said, at, at, after the funeral, some man came up to me and he said, you know, what happened to your wife? It's just not fair. It's not fair, man. And he said he turned and he walked away. And this, this man, he's the leader, he said he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Jesus, what, what does he mean it's not fair? You're the fairest among 10,000. Everything you do is just and true and I'm not offended with you. And that day there wasn't a dry eye in the class because we realized we're watching someone live out Song of Solomon 5. And I, I walked out of that class and I was bothered. Because I realized if that was me, I'm 20, but if that was me, I, I would be offended with God. <laughs> I'd be mad at God. I wouldn't be teaching on the love of God two weeks after my spouse died. And it broke me because I thought I knew something. <laughs> I thought I knew God. I'd been saved. I'd been preaching. I'd, you know, been in ministry. And I, I just said to the Lord that day, I said, you know what, God? I don't care what it takes. If, if I have to sit in a prayer room until I'm old like that guy, I, that's what I'll do. I've got to know you like that. I've got to know you. I've got to be in love with you like that. Guys, that's evangelism. <laughs> that's exactly, you know what happens in the book when she goes off on his beauty and his worth, his leadership. It makes all those questioning instead of saying, what's so great about him? You know what they say in chapter 6? Hey, where, where did he go? We want to we look for him with you. We're going to follow you and find him. That's evangelism. A life lived out. In love with God through every season. Doesn't mean every season's easy, but his love is better than wine. So that means we can live intoxicated in every season. And the hard seasons, they're bearable if your heart's intoxicated on the love of God. The difficult, challenging seasons, they make sense when you know, hey, this is the middle of the story. It's not over. My story ends with a wedding, and this is making me a ready bride, so bring it. He loves me. There's been so many times when I just come back to truths here. When I blow it and I'm grouchy with my kids or my husband, I go back to the truth. I repent, and then I go back to the truth of I'm dark yet lovely. God, you see my weakness. You know my frailty. God, I want deliverance from my sins, my weaknesses. I want transformation on the inside. And in this moment, I'm not running away from you, but I'm running to you because I'm lovely to you. You call me lovely. You enjoy me. There's so many times when I go, no, no, no. Song of Solomon 2, 4. His banner over me is love. That means that all the dealings of God in my life are for love and to produce love at the greatest level. So what I'm going through right now, I don't understand it. I can't make sense of it. I don't comprehend it, but it's for love. God, what is this saying about the romance? What are you trying to teach me about the romance? And in those moments when you're hanging on for dear life, those seasons that, that require endurance, the testing of your faith, you say, it ain't over because I'm not at a wedding. So I'm going to say yes again and again and again. And you know what he does in, in chapter 6? He silences, I mean, he shatters the silence of the dark night by saying, oh, turn your eyes away from me. You've overcome me. You're beautiful as Tirsa, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. He affirms her. He praises her. He lavishes her with affection. And we see her, she's become this mature bride. He has an inheritance in her. She's been conformed to his image. And in chapter 7, we, we, see, we see just this just complete, complete transformation. Whereas in chapter 1, she was tending everybody's vineyards and she couldn't figure out how to balance ministry and taking care of others, and keeping her own heart. She, she could not figure that out. We don't ever have to pit the two against each other. <laughs> because we see it in chapter 7, she's able to go into the vineyard. She says, come, let's go into the vineyards. Let's check on the fruit. And she says, there I will give you my love. 
So she's figured out that balance of how to love the Lord. It's the first commandment. She loves him with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then she does the second commandment, loving others. She's figured out that balance. She's, she's gotten confident in who she is before him, in her identity before him. And then in, in chapter 8, we see her getting consumed with the love of God. Love that's strong as death, jealousy unyielding as the grave. We see her, in the beginning, she's just asking for a kiss, right? Just like the kiss of revelation on my heart to awaken my heart. But by the end, she's got the seal of God set on her heart, the seal of fire. She is consumed with his love. Her life is not her own anymore. She's totally his. And the book ends the same way the book of Revelation ends. The book of Revelation ends with the church in full identity as a bride, right? Revelation 22, the, the spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus. So we see at the, the book of Revelation ending with the church in her identity as a bride, in unity with the Holy Spirit, in the place of prayer, crying out for the return of Jesus. Come back, Jesus. We want you. We miss you. Return. And Song of Solomon ends the same way. Her identity, she has her full identity as a bride, and she's crying out. You who dwell in the gardens, the companions, listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Make haste. Come, Lord Jesus. Return. Return. My, my challenge to us is, as, as we just start the study of this book, is my prayer is that God would awaken us just to the truth of his love for us, that our eyes would be open, that we wouldn't miss it. George MacDonald, he says this, he says, we who would be born again, we must wake up our souls unnumbered times every single day. It's this constant thing. It's not that you need to hear a new truth. We just need to be reminded of the same old truths. <laughs> Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we take those truths that we know in our head, and we, we, we focus on them. We pray them. We stay in them. We abide in that revelation of love until we know and believe it in our hearts, until it, it changes who we are. It changes our identity before him. We live in that revelation of God, you're ravished over me. The king, Psalm 45 says, the king desires your beauty. Worship him for he's your Lord. He's enthralled with your beauty, another translation says. Isaiah 54 says, your maker, he's your husband. And as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, Isaiah 62, says, your God, he rejoices over you. You ever seen a groom on his wedding day? He's either bawling, crying, or grinning from ear to ear. Always my favorite part of the wedding, to see when he sees his bride walking down the aisle. He's undone. And that's just a little tiny picture. It's, a, it's supposed to be a little reminder every wedding you go to that that's how God feels about you. Every single day that you wake up, that you have your bridegroom God grinning over you, <laughs> weeping over you, smiling over you. She tells him in Song of Solomon 1, your love is better than wine. And you know what he says back to her in Song of Solomon 4? Your love is better than wine to me. God who needs nothing, lacks for nothing, desires something. And that's you. That's your love. Our relationships with Jesus, they have to be about more than, than legal acquittal. A get out of hell free card. It's got to be more than that. Jesus died for more than just, all right, you walked an altar, you said a prayer, you're saved. You know, go do what you want to do. Now, at that moment, when you walked the aisle and you prayed a prayer and you gave your life to Jesus, that's Games are just beginning. Your dead soul has come alive, and for the first time, you can enter into that which you were created for, the love affair of the Trinity that you've been desired to be a part of since before the foundations of the world. 
at salvation, the games are just beginning. And our relationship with Jesus, it's got to be about more than just, okay, I'm saved, everything's good. And it's got to be more than just obedience and ministry. I'm going through the motions, but my heart checked out way back. And I'm just going through the duty, but I'm not living fascinated. I, I, don't, I don't experience my relationship with Jesus as a romance. It's kind of like a job description. When we're in that place, we're living for so much less than what we were created for and then what God longs for. We are destined for the romance. And we can live romanced with God in every season of the soul. And no matter where you are tonight, maybe you're like the Song of Sol- you know, maybe you're like the Shulamite in Song of Solomon 1. You're kind of burned out. You're tired. You neglected your own heart for whatever reasons. And you're desperate. Some of you are desperate. You're praying those desperate prayers. God, I've got to meet with you. I've got to encounter you. Where do you feed your flock? Where do you make it rest at noon? And some of you are in that season of being romanced by God. You're actually, you're just in the season of the raisins and apples. And you're, it's, it's great. And some of you are in those seasons of compromise. <laughs> You're in the, the seasons where I, I said no to the Lord, and I'm under the discipline of the Lord, and it, it's making sense a little bit. Like, oh, maybe I'm in Song of Solomon 3. Some of, you, some of you will, I feel like through this class, get healing. That happened to me. I got a lot of healing when I realized Song of Solomon 5. Oh, you don't waste a thing, God. Not that God planned evil to happen in my life. He doesn't author evil. He doesn't author abuse to happen to you, right? But he doesn't waste a thing. He doesn't waste it. All the mistreatment, all the, 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 the difficult seasons, he doesn't waste it. That's how he raises up deliverers. Jesus was qualified through that which he suffered, and God's going to qualify a bride in like manner. And I was able to reinterpret some of the suffering in my life, some of the mistreatment, and say, Oh, God, you weren't wasting a thing. You were giving me, you were rending that veil so I could see you more clearly. And when I spent some time in Song of Solomon 5, 10 through 16, and just getting understanding of the leadership of Jesus and the beauty of Jesus, his head's like the finest gold. He's the perfect leader. Oh, I fell in love with him. And somehow in the midst of it all, through understanding who he was, I began to get confident that he loved me that I was his favorite one, that if I do really good or if I do really bad, it doesn't matter. He loves me. I begin to say at 25 years old, I'm successful. I love God. He loves me. That's it. That's all I need to know. My assignments will change. Seasons will look different. But at the end of the day, His banner over me is love. All of my life, it's about getting me ready for that wedding. There's a wedding coming. And he doesn't waste a thing. He doesn't waste a thing. So I want to encourage you, as you're going through this study, a few things in the Song of Solomon. Number one, I want to encourage you to to read it in the Bible. (laughs) Read through these eight chapters of Song of Solomon. Write it up. Mark it up. Highlight it. Ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about this? He'll speak to you about it. But read through it. Get get familiar with the language of it. And then take some of these truths and pray them. Get dark yet lovely, Song of Solomon 1.5. Get that one in your pocket. Get it so deep in your heart that you're praying it and you're singing it and you're meditating on it in your prayer time so that when you... Because it, it, that verse is, works really, it feels really good when you're feeling pretty spiritual and pretty awesome. Like, I'm dark, but lovely. I'm dark. Yeah, I know I'm dark, like sin, nature, but I'm lovely to you, God, because I feel lovely right now. But in the moments when you feel dark, like you've just blown it and you know it, you've just had a flesh fit and you know it, that's the moment when you go to that verse, when you feel dark. I'm sinful. My heart is dark before you. And you don't run and put yourself on the bench, but you run to his arms. Get Song of Solomon 4. Oh, you've ravished his heart with one glance of your eye, with one link of your necklace. Hear Jesus saying in Song of Solomon 2, let me see your face. 
let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. No one can replace you in God's heart. In every area of life, you're replaceable, but not in the kingdom. You're irreplaceable. There's no one like you. No one can bring your song. No one can pray your prayer. The billions of people on earth and that have lived throughout history, no one is like you. No one can minister to his heart the way that you can. He says, let me hear your voice. You want to have a prayer life? Hear God saying that. It will make you want to pray. You want to hear my voice? Okay, I'll talk. Understand his beauty as the bridegroom king. Understand that all of life is preparing you, maturing you, to make you that ready bride till you're completely consumed by love. Take these verses, pull them out, pull the different verses out, take them into your prayer time, sing them, pray them, write about them, journal them, dance them, paint them, whatever you do, run them, like whatever, like keep them before you. Put them on note cards, whatever, write them on your hand. He writes your name on his hand. Isaiah says, you write his word on your hands. Whatever it takes, just get these truths into your heart. It'll change. It'll change you. Like Billy said, it changed his emotional chemistry. It will change you. It will give you confidence like you've never had before. You realize that God of the universe is radically in love with you, and you are created for love. Amen. Let's, let's stand and pray together. Father, I pray that you would release revelation to us, to each one of us, that, that your kingdom, it's all about getting us ready to marry your son, that you are committed to, to this mission, and that this age is going to end with a glorious wedding, and everything in our life is for love and to produce love at the highest level, all of your dealings with us. God, I pray that you would give us revelation into this book, into this greatest love song, the story of all stories, the song of all songs, how you feel about us, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would begin to change the way we think about your leadership and the way that you deal with us. God, I pray that through this class we would see your kindness that leads us to repentance. We would see your gentleness in the way that you, you deal with us. Lord, I pray that we would fall in love with you all over again. That our relationship with you, it would be a romance, not a job. It would be a love affair of the heart. It would be a wild adventure that takes our breath away. God, open our eyes to see it. Kiss us with the kisses of your word. Let us drink deeply of your love that's better than wine. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed to go pick up your kids. If you need notes from last week or have any questions about the notes, Alicia is down in the front right here, and she can help you and happy to answer any questions you have. God bless you. Shake